very serious. We have a panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> How many of you saw Sight Machine last night? Oh, All sweet. right. Yeah. Thank you. And have you all seen the exhibition? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we begin, please turn off all your electronic devices. Actually. Um, all right, we got it. And um, uh, during the question and answer period at the, uh, at the end of the panel, we, will have two, we do already have two microphones on either side. Um, the panel is being webcast, so please use the microphone so that we our internet audience can see and hear your questions. See you and hear your questions. Ready? As ever. Good evening. <laughs> I'm John Jacob, McAvoy Family Curator for Photography at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm Tre I am not Trevor. I am <laughs> curator <laughs> of Trevor Peglin Sights Unseen. I'll be your master of ceremonies tonight uh, for what I'm sure will be a most interesting conversation. I want to extend my thanks to the participants and to all the SAM staff who've worked with me on this and other programs related to the exhibition. My, my microphone is escaping me. During my research for the exhibition, one statement by Trevor really st struck me, and it was important to my understanding of the arc of his work. From, in an essay from 2009 entitled Frontier Photography, he wrote that contemporary, contemporary reconnaissance satellites have closed the temporal loop between surveying, ordering, and targeting. In contrast to the slow-moving survey photographers of the 19th century, whose enormous glass plate cameras were carried by mule wagons, these satellites work in real time. They broadcast live photo intelligence to operators below, who then transmit targeting co coordinates to airborne command stations, Tomahawk cruise missiles, and smart bombs in B-2 stealth bombers. The essay describes imaging technologies designed in the aftermath of World War II, used by spy satellites launched in the 1970s during the Cold War. Those technologies are today ubiquitous in digital cameras and cell phones. The football field-sized antenna developed to monitor adversaries from outer space have evolved into the tiny tracking devices in our pockets, and each now directly communicates with the other. On the one hand, by bridging these seemingly disparate moments, this statement underscores the historical link of photography with surveillance and surveillance with violence. On the other hand, the essay also poses a question about the present. What does it mean that in our own post post-Cold War era, the violent gaze of the state has been turned upon its own citizenry. In the 1970s, real-time intelligence by satellites was still broadcast to operators below, human intermediaries trained to see and interpret operational images and morally accountable for the consequences of their decisions. Today, those intermediaries are being replaced by algorithms with the expansion of artificial intelligence into the field of intelligence gathering by corporate and government entities, the evaluation of economic and political targets has been outsourced to seeing machines. And with the advent of personal tracking devices, the border lines of privacy that once separated everyday life from the economic and ge geopolitical, geopolitical spheres has dissolved. In a world of ubiquitous targeting by seeing machines, questions of accountability arise. Who's being defined as an economic or political target and on what grounds? Who is excluded and why? What does accountability look like 
and can it be built into automated seeing systems? Or is there function to legitimate our economic desires and political biases by automating them? Looking for guidance with questions such as these, in August 2017, I, I convened a conversation with Kate Crawford, Wendy Chun, and Trevor Peglin to discuss this new image terrain. If images are, in some sense, the defining characteristic, characteristic of human history and culture, I asked them, are image makers and cultural institutions adequate to the challenges of this historical moment's radical redefinition? of humanity. Tonight I hope to revisit that question, focusing on the ethical and legal challenges accompanying the advance of artificial intelligence and strategies we might use to successfully meet those challenges. I'm pleased to introduce tonight's guests. Alvaro Bedoya is the founder of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law, where he's also a visiting prof professor of law and directs the law school's federal legislation clinic. Before coming to Georgetown, he served as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law, and advised, uh, advised its chair on civil rights, immigration, and intellectual property matters. He also served as lead advisor in the sup Supreme Court con confirmation hearings of Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. Wendy Hui Kyung Chung will be the Canada 150 Research Chair in New Media at Simon Fraser University, Canada, and is currently visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, Cent Pennsylvania's Center for Media at Risk at the Annenberg, Cent at the Annenberg School for Communication. She has studied both systems design engineering and, and English literature which she combines and mutates in her current work on digital media. Kate Crawford is, di is Distinguished Research Professor at New York University, a Principal Researcher at Microsoft Research New York, and Visiting Professor at the MIT Media Lab. She's the Co-Founder and Co-Director of AI Now Research Institute at NYU, a new interdisciplinary center dedicated to studying the social impacts of artificial intelligence. And finally, Trevor Paglin is an American artist and geographer whose work spans image making, sculpture, investigative journalism, writing, engineering, and numerous other disciplines. Among his chief concerns are learning how to see the historical moment we live in and develop, developing the means to imagine alternative futures. In 1936, the artist Laszlo maholy Naj wrote, the illiterate of the future will be the person ignorant of the use of the camera as well as of the pen. Today, as Trevor Paglin has written, if we want to understand the invisible world of machine-machine visual culture, we need to unlearn how to see like humans. These two observations illuminate the central, quest, the central challenges facing artists and cultural institutions at this moment a moment when the old protocols appear to be inadequate to the task at hand. In a world of machine vision and, in, and invisible images, what place remains for vision and visual literacy? In a world of bots and fake news, what place remains for communication and for meaning? And in a world where human seeing is discounted, what place remains for ideas of rep representation and critique? I'd like to begin our conversation by asking Kate and Alvaro to describe the state of AI at this moment. It's been <laughs> a year of extraordinary developments for artificial intelligence, most of them bringing a lot of bad publicity to it. <laughs> uh, Kate from the perspective of technology and Alvaro from that of law and his unique vantage point here in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you, John. I guess I'm just going to begin by congratulating Trevor on such an extraordinary retrospective. I just saw it today. It's really <laughs> remarkable. And I also want to congratulate John on managing to curate Trevor into a federal building. So congratulations <laughs> <laughs> to you. Not a, not a small task. Um, so it's, it's really an, an honor and a privilege to be joining you all on stage tonight. Um, it's obviously 
an incredibly important moment to have these conversations about artificial intelligence, visuality, and politics. And from my vantage point at the AI Now Institute, we just did this really terrifying exercise of gathering together all of the biggest headlines around AI and tech companies over the last 12 months. And I can just tell you, if there's a reason you're feeling a bit exhausted and overwhelmed in the technological realm, you are not alone. This has been an extraordinary year. I mean, in any other year, Cambridge Analytica and their attempt to manipulate opinion and voting would have been the biggest story. And now it's just one of many scandals which we can trace through uh, a year that you know, brought up Project Maven and the use of AI in the military, right through to the way that AI tools are being used to deny people job opportunities or access to housing and access to Medicaid. So there are a lot of things happening. I think one of the things that's most interesting to me is how we dig into this question of accountability. Uh, right now, we've seen sort of two camps emerge. On one side, you have a camp uh, which has become very, very popular just in the last 18 months or so of technologists trying to make these tools fairer and somehow unbiased them by using tech fixes. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that this is trying to apply a sort of a thin technical band-aid to a set of much deeper structural social problems. On the other side, you have this sort of turn to ethics as in the hope that somehow ethics codes and ethics principles will, will save the day uh, in a climate where there's no regulation. And I think while this is a noble goal, um, it's not going to be sufficient to, to the task we have ahead, which is to really think about how these systems are affecting the lives of many people, but particularly those communities who are most marginalized, I think, have the most to lose from these systems. And I think this is certainly something that, that Trevor's work really brings to the foreground in a way that uh, we rarely get to see, I think, in, in museums such as this one, where you can see how these systems actually create representations of the human in ways that don't necessarily map to our own understandings of the human. Do you want to so, talk a little bit about like what yeah. are some of those greatest hits of like AI malfeasance this year, just so we have a few kind of yeah. concrete examples? Well, on the I'd, table I'd love to, to think put about. it to you. I mean, I, I have a list that I just published this week, and it was it was terrifying to me. I mean, for me, it was really looking at. Um, the sort of crisis that's happened across, I'd say, the five big tech firms in the US, and to see that you know Facebook was hit with everything from you know civil suits around denying people uh, jobs, through to potentially inciting genocide in Myanmar back in April, um, through to you know Amazon developing uh, basically a, a machine learning system to scan people's resumes, and it was found that it was just consistently um, downgrading all resumes from women. In in fact, even if you just had the word woman in a CV, it would actually be downgraded um, by Amazon system. And, and these are some of the biggest companies who have like the, the most well-trained engineers and, and large-scale systems. So we're, we're seeing breaks emerge, I think, in this narrative that somehow AI systems are more objective, more neutral, uh, equivalent or better than human intelligence. I think the good thing of this year is that we're starting to be more critical of that. Alvaro, I'd love to hear from you. Sure, yeah, and, and I want to expand on two points you hit on, which is this lack of regulation and its mm. disparate impact. Mm. So um, despite the state of technology, I think there's still a lot of folks out there who say, yeah, you know, artificial intelligence is interesting, maybe it's a little scary, but it doesn't really affect me or mm -hmm. the critical decisions in my life. And when in reality it is, you know, pervasive, it is now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is affecting central decisions about your life and how you live it, and it is by and large you know, in DC we say unregulated, let's just call it not under control. It is out of control. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the clearest example I can share is, is and for me, the, um, the greatest hit of the last couple of years in terms of uh, um, uh, mistakes is police face recognition. Mm. So um, I bet most folks in this room uh, uh, would say, you know, would guess that they are not, that you are not in a criminal face recognition system. And, and, and why would you be? You know, you know, you're not in a DNA, uh, a criminal DNA database. You're not probably in a criminal fingerprint database. Um, but as a matter of fact, the vast majority of you are in a criminal face recognition database, either by having a passport or, in the case of DC, a Maryland driver's license. And so the vast majority of you in this room have your faces searched through a machine learning field system. Uh, uh, that is looking for criminal suspects. And you've had it searched hundreds if not thousands of times over the course of the last couple of years. 
And because there is no federal or state law that poses any constraints on that, it's been used for good. It was used to identify the Annapolis shooter, but it's also been used by uh, Baltimore County Police to thin out the crowd at the Freddie Gray protests mm -hmm. uh, by picking up people in social media who had outstanding warrants for their arrests. And um, as for the disparate impact part of this, if you're hearing this and you're saying, well, you know, uh, um, I'm not a criminal, maybe it's not that big a deal, I'm not a criminal face recognition yeah. database, uh, uh, and, and, well, and, and we can divide you into, into two halves to be a little provocative. You know, if you're hearing this and you are older, uh, uh, you are a man, uh, uh, and you, have, you are white, you, you are Caucasian, you have a lighter complexion, then, um, then you, you might be okay. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is that a lot of these systems uh, were trained on disproportionately white male and older faces. Uh, and also because of some complex uh, uh, facts about how film was developed in the West mm -hmm. that only compounds this. But if you are n none of those things, uh, uh, then you should be worried or even more worried because when these warrantless, uh, 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 opaque secret searches are run on your face, the system is less likely to find the actual perpetrator and more likely to find someone totally unrelated to that alleged crime, i.e. you. Uh, uh, so <laughs> these systems are very real. Uh, uh, they are very uh, widespread. We are all in them, and they are not under control. And one of my favorite uh, examples of this was actually done by the ACLU, who did this, yes. this fantastic yes, 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 intervention. Yes, yes. Did, some, did some of you see this? They basically used one of these facial recognition systems uh, on the faces of how many senators was it in the end? I think it was uh, of the order it of... It was 20... I think they did it on, on all of them, but they right. found at least 28 who were misidentified as uh, uh, criminals. Right. Uh, who are matched to criminal yeah, mugshots. You know, so I looked at that study, though, and I disagreed with it because those oh, yeah. guys are criminals. It was under. It was under <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But if you want to get politicians to care about facial recognition, you know, make sure they turn up in one of those searches, and suddenly the conversation shifts. So it was quite an amazing intervention. Yes. So Trevor, uh, and maybe Kate, um, I think one of the things that would be interesting that we've spoken a little bit about is, is, is now that we've spoken about the present, adding a, a bit of historical dimension mm -hmm. to that. And there are a lot of different ways that we can approach that. One of them that we've spoken about is Galton, mm -hmm. um, but, there are, but there are others. And, and I think that this is very much where you've gone in part of your work. Yeah. So first of all, I want to thank you for putting this together, John. I want to thank you guys for showing up, your longtime interlocutors and, and very good friends. And so it's just very, it touches my heart to, that, that you're all here. And I wanna, there's a, I actually have a lot of my family in the audience too, the aunts and the uncles and cousins. So I wanna thank you guys all so much for coming as well. That means the world to me. Pagelin um, family, stand up, <laughs> take responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of you, and you've all been photographed. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> um, so, yeah, in, I guess I think about a lot of different kinds of history in, in the, the images that I make and a lot of the artwork that I make. And one of the, the threads is an interest in photography, like just very simply. And it's interesting how you see the same kinds of conversations come up over and over again. You know, history rhymes in a way, it doesn't repeat, but, and the example that you mentioned, Galton, was that when photography was kind of invented in the, in the 19th century, it was really unlike anything that had existed before, but one of, one of the kind of features of it, and this even remains true to this day, is that uh, people thought that oh, this is an objective way of looking at the world. You know, if you use this machine, then the thing that the machine makes can be neutral in a way that a human can't, in a way that a, like a painter can't, or even the way that a human eye cannot be. Right? And so, say say a little bit about how, just for anyone who doesn't know, how Galton. Well, made, I was made the, I was getting to images. that. Okay. I was getting yeah. to that. You're, so you have a, a moment in history where we see the you know ability to make. Technolo images through by technological means. And that comes along with the kind of belief that because it's technology, 
it's neutral and objective and can tell you something scientific mm -hmm. about the world that other, you know, that painting, for example, can, right? And that quickly, you see a, sar and, and some of that's true. You can see early x-ray photography and, and you see early forms of medical imaging, but very quickly, uh, it, there's a kind of domain creep, right? And, and someone like Galton says, well, a, a camera can objectively see people, so we should be able to see, you know, whether you're a criminal or not by looking at somebody's face. And you see the advent of discipline, disciplines like physiognomy and phrenology and the early efforts to do kind of statistical analyses of people's faces and people's bodies in order to, you know, try to decide whether they're a, a criminal or a pedophile or, you know, a, a loose women or, you know, had all these kind of, you know, deviant categories that they thought you could uh, measure, really. And that kind of thing has a very bad history, <laughs> as we know, you know, that, that went in some very dark places. Um, but we see a kind of, I see just a lot of, a lot of echoes of those kind, kinds of conversations. Well, if we fast forward here to 2018 and are looking at things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, whether that is systems being used in criminal justice or whether that's used in systems that are looking at your pictures on Facebook and trying to figure out, you know, what gender you are or what products you like or what your facial expression means. And, and this was something that was coming up in the Sight Machine performance where we're analyzing the faces and saying, oh, John's 57% female or 43% sad. And it's kind of a joke in the performance, but if you think about it a little bit more, it's really dark. You know. Kate, you've spoken about uh, the eugenic impulse. I mean, sort of bringing it up, up to the present, then the eugenic impulse related to, to this, what, what, what's happening now? I mean, it's interesting because I think you can, again, sort of trace it back to some of the earliest instantiations of these tools. Um, one of the ones that I think is really remarkable is the first ever study on facial recognition, which was done by Woody Bleslow in January 1963. And this was a CIA-funded study. Um, it's still not um, fully public, but it is sort of circulated through various networks. And in, in this very early paper, you can see that the concern was, how do we recognize faces? And at this point, it was all about trying to categorize people into one of two genders. So you're either male or female. No other options would be considered. And it was very oriented around race recognition, so being able to put people into a very small number of race categories. So even at the very earliest instantiations of these technologies, it was about a, f a type of classification of the human in ways that can produce its own type of systemic violence. I mean, again, now, I mean, if we see in 2018 the discussions around how people choose to self-identify with gender. The idea that you would have two seems kind of extraordinary. But even Facebook, as recently as three years ago, only had two gender categories. It's now, does anybody know the number? It's up to like 76, I think was the last time I checked, which can look like progress. But it can also still look like a form of mass categorization where you've made a design choice to say you are one of the following options, as opposed to saying having a free text box or having sort of no category at all. So these classificatory impulses is something that, that I've done a lot of research on over the last few years, and, and it, it, it sort of matches these histories from Sir Francis Galton, but also through some of the earliest uh, as scientists who were building these tools were really trying to find, I think, quite simplistic ways of categorizing humans. And unfortunately, those, those ways get built and embedded in to the sort of deep substrates of artificial intelligence systems, and it's very hard to see them. You really have to try and pry them apart. But those systems are often protected by trade secret law or by you know, a range of sort of complexities in how the systems are designed. Personally, I'm really fascinated in how we train these systems because even by looking at the training data, you can see how they start to come to the way of seeing the world that they reach. And, and for me, that's, that's a really exciting possibility as a researcher that we can really start to dig into those layers. But I want to be clear, I mean, this is hard. These systems are designed to be opaque. They're designed to be closed systems that give you single predictions and, and, and answers. And I think it's, it's really good that we're starting to see a more critical conversation spring up around that. Interesting. Wendy, you, 
you've spoken about verification, and I think that that's sort of the next the next level looking looking down. We're, other than classification, how do we verify verify this? Yeah, what's being and, done? and this links really nicely to the discussion of eugenics that has already emerged. So what I've been thinking about is it's not just that um, these algorithms are trained on in this really problematic way, but they're also verified in really problematic ways, right? So how do you know um, a machine learning algorithm is correct, right? Well, you test its ability to predict the past, right? So you test its ability to predict um, data that's been hidden from it during the training stage, okay? So what this means is that if the past is racist, these algorithms will only be validated as correct if they make racist predictions, right? Okay, so the question is what to do, because John said we have to think about, okay, given this, what should we do? Okay, so here's one thing. I'm for us being kind of perverse about this. And I'm, what if we just thought of these as really expensive and computationally intense programs that companies have, pr have produced in order to prove they discriminate, <laughs> right? Um, so to go back to the AI example with Amazon, right? What if we took the fact that if you have a woman's college on your CV, you go down a couple of notches. Um, apparently, if you're named Chad, you go up. Um, <laughs> what if lacrosse, we, weirdly, if you yeah. played lacrosse, you'll go up. Nobody really knows why, very strange. You might be Canadian. Uh, <laughs> But so what if it, and so like it, Am Amazon has said, okay, we're not gonna use this, right? Mm -hmm. Good. But what if we actually, given the fact it was trained on all their hiring data, That's right. what if we actually yeah. used it as a point of intervention, right? Mm. So in other words, what if we treated these things like um, diagnostic models, like global climate change models, right? So global climate change models show us what's the mo most likely future. So we'll intervene and do something entirely different. Um, now, I bring up global climate change models because they're so problematic, right? And the question is, do we need another model? Like, what does this modeling do? Uh, like, for whom is discriminatory hiring practices in Silicon Valley actually news, right? Um, <laughs> but the, re the other reason why I think we should think through them in this way, and this is where I think, you know, Trevor, your work is really important, is that it tries, it gets us to try to think about what we mean by verification, what we mean by repetition, right? And one thing I would encourage us to do, and I'm just throwing it, it out there as, as another perverse idea, is that we lose the vocabulary of auditing. Um, because that just assumes that there are little tweaks that we can make with these numbers, and then these systems would be okay, um, rather than larger fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I would say, and this goes to, to the really wonderful um, work um, th that's been brought up in terms of the relationship between eugenics and machine learning is that if the future seems close to us now, if it seems like the future doesn't vary from the past, it's because of the model of history that's embedded within these algorithms. Right? So in these algorithms, the past and the present and the future are genetically similar. The future cannot be radically different. Right? And this is because a lot of the algorithms they draw from um, have grounded, draw from eugenics, right? So linear regression, um, support vector machines. Do you want to pull that out as an idea a little bit? Like what sure. would be an example of like the ways in which it, uh, an automated system is going to reproduce the past, as it were? Like w in like what domain? Like right, so, if, if so the way that these work, even in that, right, so the prediction that's made is based on the past. So they figure out a correlation. Like in law enforcement. In law enforcement, or law enforcement or, or, or in hiring, right? Mm -hmm, you find yeah. a correlation mm -hmm. between the name Chad and someone who's successful, mm -hmm. right? right? And therefore you assume Chad is gonna be, another Chad will be successful in mm -hmm. the future. Okay, now correlation actually comes from eugenesis. It comes from the work of Pearson, who was a follower mm -hmm. of Galton. Um, and he argued um, that if anything repeats, if anything is correlated, it's because of nurture, not nature. Mm -hmm. So he made the argument that, there, in fact, there, uh, nurture makes almost no difference, learning makes almost no difference, everything is nature, 
right? So the future cannot be radically different from the past. Okay, so Chads let's- are predisposed towards to being high right. performers. Exactly. That <laughs> exactly. So like, think about it. This is so mind blowing because the valley is allegedly all about disruption, mm -hmm. but this is the least disruptive notion of the future you could possibly <laughs> have, right? The future can't be different. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, and so the question becomes, how can we intervene and create different kinds of futures, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than giving up to these theories that are already embedded. Mm -hmm. if, if the future can't be different, then predictive models like climate change won't help. So, yeah, so that's the point. Well, the, this is the thing. And, they, and so we might as well just say it doesn't exist. It's no, no, no. So, so when global climate change models say the temperature is going to go up by 1%, we don't then say, let's fix the model, right? We say, let's do something so that actually these models would become unverifiable. If we believe they're true, we will act in such a way that we won't know if their predictions are true. Hence, we need a different notion of verifiability. Because if we wait it, which, we, which is arguably what we've already done, then we've lost the map battle. We can say, yay, we're, we're correct. <laughs> it's gone up by two <laughs> degrees, but we're totally, uh, oh, sorry, this is being taped and we're in a federal <laughs> building. <laughs> It rhymes with, <laughs> um, right? So, so the point is that these can therefore, the future can't be closed in this way. I mean, that's the thing we need to really um, interrogate and intervene in. But it's interesting because we had this conversation specifically so about uh, climate change models, which you will see in the book, uh, Sites Unseen, for this exhibition. Um, and it was, it was fascinating because the three of us, I remember, were like, well, the, all of this work is done if we try to think about you know, long histories of data that produced strong climate modeling that has, I think, become a really important contribution to how we understand our world. We haven't seen those models produce anything like sufficient change. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I worry that this sort of belief that somehow oh, we just have to think outside the technical box and then we can make the future our own again. Is, is somehow making it sound a lot easier than it is. Mm -hmm. And that these systems actually foreclose ways of thinking. I, I absolutely agree with you. <coughs> and this is where, um, so I am, my sweetheart is a global climate change modeler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, this stuff is tough. I mean, and the math is tough. Everything's tough about it. Um, and there's the question of, of what can be done. But I think this is why it's important to grapple with this, because it is a tough, it's tough, and what we're facing now is tough as well. I, if I can intervene kind of with the policy and legal hat on, um, there's another way in which the legal world is very similar to this machine learning world where in the American legal system and the common law system, what is right is what is precedent. Mm -hmm. And so when you go argue to a court, you don't say, hey judge, this is the better outcome because you know my client's a pretty great guy. Mm -hmm. right. You say, oh, this is the right outcome because we've always done things this way which is kind of a crazy way to decide legal disputes, but it's the way we decide it. Uh, um, but the, the thing that stands out to me is how I is the inherent kind of unfixability of these systems, mm -hmm. because me as a policy person, uh, um, and a as a bit of a cynic, uh, uh, I look at you know, the pervasiveness of face recognition system and I say, yeah, you know, we should ban certain uses of it. I don't think it should be used in immigration enforcement. I don't think it should be on body cameras, uh, um, but, you know, when you spend billions of dollars on these systems, when the vast majority of the American people are enrolled in these systems, uh, um, it's a question of making it less terrible, mm -hmm. you know, and, and bringing it under control and regulating it like wiretaps. Uh, you know, I can't wiretap someone for jaywalking, right? I can wiretap you if I go to a judge, establish probable cause, time, place, manner limits for, you know, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, in my view, is a less terrible future than the one we're currently headed towards. But from a, a previous conversation we had, Trevor, you pointed out the inherent you know, poverty of that idea that we can fix these systems, mm -hmm. right? And, and I thought that was really valuable. Ooh, well, well, thank you. I mean, like, I, to me, that in one of the bodies of work in the show are these um, kind of AI-generated images. Yes. And, um, what, and there's one, when you build a, an AI system, one of the, first things that you have to do when you're gonna build it is you have to define 
what are the things that you're looking for? In other words, what counts as something intel an intelligible result? An example would that be if I build a facial recognition system that is designed to uh, figure out if you're a man or a woman. You have to predefine that gender is binary and that you can be a man or a woman. So you create that taxonomy that's baked into it. And then you give it training images. You say, here's all pictures of men, here's a picture of women. And then uh, when you do that, then you can set up a webcam and it will say, you know, John's a woman and I'm a man or wh whatever it is. You know? um, and the, I guess what I, what this is something we've thought about a lot is that in that first instance of creating that taxonomy, you are already baking in a biases, right. racisms, right. et cetera, et cetera, by virtue of in the first instance saying these are some things that count as meaningful and then Im implicitly also say there's a bunch of other stuff that doesn't count as meaningful. Right. You're already strongly you know, narrowing down uh, the range of what you can see at all. Right? Right. And so um, what I was doing was building neural networks that are all based on ways of seeing where the image doesn't mean the thing that it looks like. Right. <laughs> so for, for example, one is based, it's a neural network that can only see images of things that are relevant to Freudian psychoanalysis, right? So it's a neural network and you set up a camera and then you point it around the room and it will, it can only see things like syringes and windows and ballrooms and like puffy faces and scabby throats and everything that it will see is it will interpret mm -hmm. through that framework. You know? and, the, and the joke is kind of like, that's ridiculous. The other part of the joke is, in Freudian psychoanalysis, those things do not mean <laughs> what, what, they, what they are, in a way. And the, um, but the third part of the joke is that like, that is actually a perfectly reasonable system of generating meaning that is precisely the kind of thing that an AI cannot do, right? And so I, I guess that's where I'm coming from with a background of, from art and literature, is thinking about what are all the ways in which Meanings are not self-evident whatsoever. Hmm. And, they're, and the meanings of things are always being contested. So for example, gender. You know, this is the concept of gender being dualistic mm -hmm. has been strongly, strongly, right. and very publicly, and very successfully contested. So, so since the advent of you know, queer liberation, as well as more recent kind of trans activism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we have, uh, decided that it's a good idea to ch change the meaning of what those images are. Mm -hmm. It's a part of self-representation. And so at a very, to bring this back into what, how do technical systems work or how do AI systems work, um, for me, it's a big kind of almost like a meta critique of the project of AI in the first place, right? right? right. You know? Right. Um, one other thing on the policy front, because we have a lot of yeah. DC folks here, the other thing that is really valuable is um, is showing the, the, that the language of surveillance is no longer a human language. Yeah. So um, I go upstairs, I see two things. I, th I see things that are pulling back the veil on surveillance activity. Yeah. But for me, the most interesting ones are the ones that are pulling back the veil on the language of mm -hmm. surveillance. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, both have always been secret, right? You know, Elizabeth I, you know, uh, had a secret spy network, but also hired the, the, the best mathematicians in her queendom to make and break codes. So it's always been secret, that's not, that's not news. What is news that your, your, your work illustrates is that now the language in which this surveillance is conducted isn't made by humans for humans, it is made by machines for machines, and it can be utterly unintelligible to humans and to our values. Yeah. And to see a visual representation of that, mm -hmm. you know, a couple blocks from the FBI building, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, is pretty powerful, I thought. Yeah, there were points in Sight Machine where, uh, it was act at the beginning, actually, where, where in the first piece where the, you told me what it's called, but it's essentially the, the numbers right. rather than the images. And yeah. You see, um, it's just a torrent of data. And um, it was 
I, I watched this during the rehearsal, rehearsals because I, I got to take a few days off <laughs> and just watch the musicians. And from time to time, there was just this torrent of numbers, and each time it was it was the most startling thing that I saw. Mm -hmm. um, and and I guess that was the raw data behind um, the artificial intelligence that you're s interpreting for us to see. So I see two, you know, thinking about what can we do? What can we do? And um, I see two models uh, here on stage, one, one of which um, is um, non-functional satellites, one of which is an act of imagination to show us that we can think differently, that we can act differently. And another is AI now, um, the institute that Kate Kate has has started, and I'm and I'm, I mean I, I'd like but to I talk. Think another one is Wendy's. Yes, you, I, you know, all right. You know, I think there are forget others. Forget auditability. But forget you know, <laughs> forget risk assessment. You know. And also, I say Alvaro's yeah. work in exactly. Georgetown. Yeah. I think that all of each one of these people represents a, a place. But I have a question that I'm leading to, <laughs> <laughs> because I, my my so with, with with AI now I'm especially interested in you know and going back to the art question, um, you have uh, specialists in human rights and policy and labor, um, but you also have a writer in residence and two artist affiliates, one of whom is Trevor, and I'm I'm really interested. And you also have specialists in museum and archival studies and historical epistemology. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, this is really interesting to me. It's not, so it's not just creating an institute, it's creating an interdisciplinary institute and a, and a pretty interesting one at that. So I'd, how does that work? How do, how, do, how do you approach AI? How are you thinking of approaching AI through these disparate fields? Well, thank you. I mean, I guess for us, um, the reason the AI Now Institute uh, came into being was because uh, several years ago, um, myself and my co-founder Meredith Whitaker were um, hosting an event where we were looking at you know who were the leading people thinking about these social, ethical, political implications of AI systems, and we looked all around the world. We looked at all of the AI institutes, and they were all purely technical institutes. They were all doing code, algorithms, and they weren't thinking about these questions. They weren't thinking about legal and policy. They weren't thinking about theory. They weren't thinking about history and epistemology. And, and it struck me that if there's one thing we're really going to need in the next 10 to 15 years as these, these tools really start to infiltrate into every social institution from healthcare to education to criminal justice to housing, you name it, these systems will be touching our lives. We have to be prioritizing these, these more social and political implications. So we decided it was time to actually really make a challenge. Can we make artificial intelligence an interdiscipline? Mm. Can we make it a space where all of these disciplines can work together to think about the true implications of what we build? And interestingly, historically you can. I mean, AI used to be much more of a sort of an interdisciplinary space um, back in the late 1950s and 60s when the discipline was first emerging. I mean, you had people like Margaret Mead on the same stage as like Herbert Dreyfus. You had these like extraordinary combinations of great minds from anthropology and computer science having these conversations about what it meant to create intelligent systems. So for us, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's taking, taking up that provocation and saying, what do we need to do now? Hence the, the title AI Now. And for us to have artists like Heather Dewey Hagborg and Trevor there has been so powerful because I think in art you can do a lot in terms of surfacing these issues and making them feel palpable. Um, I think there are so many different parts that we can all play, but to create a space, we wanted to create a community where everyone can come together and have these sorts of conversations and then hopefully have these sorts of policy implications that people like Alvaro have been so instrumental um, in really changing the way these tools will be regulated and will be controlled. So that's my hope and, and that's why it's so exciting to see you all here tonight. Um, obviously really interested and animated in what we do about these tools, but also I think Trevor's work is one of the ways that you can see it and start just even having these conversations, I think, to feel empowered enough to say, hey, I have an opinion about these tools. This is something that I think art and culture is very, very useful in doing. What I think, Trevor, your work really does beautifully is get us to think about learning in a different sense. Mm. Right? Um, and that's what I find so fascinating, because if, like, relying on eugenics, learning actually gets destroyed and instead you have this bizarre notion of repetition as, as 
always what seals. What's interesting is the ways in which you open these things to different notions of um, discovery, um, non-discovery, right? Um, the, both the boundaries that you come across as the, as the ones you open are important. Um, the reinterpretation even of badges, right? The ways things get recirculated, um, which goes into the whole notion of precedent, but in a different way, put in a different sense and reuse it. So I think you, you're opening up that whole notion of, of learning in such a fascinating way that's important as we have these conversations. Mm. In fact, Trevor, why don't you tell us a bit about how you learn to use these systems? Because obviously you've now trained AI systems, and that's, mm. that's not a small, or should we say cheap task. That's the other big trick about this. It's actually really expensive to create AI systems. And as much as we like to say these are you know, democratic technologies, they're, they're really the opposite of that. They're really very expensive planetary networks. How yeah. did you train yourself to, to do this work? How did I train myself to do? Um, and yeah. who are the amazing people that you work with? Who yeah, well, I, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so for, so I started looking at computer vision systems and tried to do a project around 2008, probably, I think, because I just saw this stuff coming online and was like, I want to work with these tools. I want to understand these forms of vision that are being created. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I got really frustrated because you, you, you kind of couldn't use them in the same way that you could now. There were things that were happening in laboratories or in, in kind of proprietary contexts. And I actually wrote, when Harun Faroqi died, I wrote an obituary about him, about how I had tried to update his project and like failed miserably because <laughs> like, because on one hand the tools were not available and on the second hand there was, it was fundamentally a series of like invisible operations that were going on that there, that was hard to then translate back into things that were images. So for example, at that time, in the beginning of Time Machine where it's just all the raw mm. numbers, like that's what it looks like and like that's not, you can't look at that as a human in a way. It's not in a form that makes sense to us. Um, so f fast forward several years, and um, th there's become some more open source kind of tools that become more ubiquitous. Obviously, um, the, the machines get more, you know, you get more processing power for your buck. And on the other hand, the, these tools are becoming more and more ubiquitous. You know, it's starting to show up that even your phone can recognize faces and that. And that is the result, uh, and that kind of goes in parallel with the, um, the kind of standardized algorithms becoming open source or at least like openly available on one hand. And then actually started working with Leaf, who's right there in the front row, who's an incredibly talented um, software developer. and you know, started being able to develop some of our own tools to, to work with these things. But when you're, when you're training a neural network, it is an extraordinary amount of labor that goes into it. You know, if I'm creating a training set of, you know, images from Freud's dreams or whatever, and I have 12 categories, syringes and puffy faces or whatever, I need to have thousands of labeled images of each of those categories. And so, we had, would have to write tools that would go and like scrape the internet for like whatever kind of crap random images are out there, which by the way is how it's done in real life. <laughs> and then you have to sit there and like we, I would just spend the weekends like with interns and we'd be like going through like hundreds <laughs> of thousands of photographs, you know, kind of <laughs> putting this crap together, you know, and then, and then when you, and then you kind of have to like bake it really like or train it, which takes about a week on the on the desktop computer. And so it is a very labor intensive process at, at, at every stage. But the other thing that I do want to point out is that when I would caution people you into thinking that what I'm doing is actually AI, mm -hmm. it's not. You know, in in. I'm playing around with some with a personal computer and a neural network. When we're actually talking about AI at scale, it really, the way that it is now using machine learning and neural, deep convolutional neural networks, and that really starts in about 2012 because companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon had gotten to the point where they could literally surveil everything in the planet and store it, <laughs> right? And so, and that is really, when a technique like neural networks starts really cooking and, and being able to do real work. And neural networks have been understood since like the early 50s, if not the late 1940s. But I guess what they, and they failed, 
And the reason why they failed is that it turns out <laughs> you need to have you know, trillions of well. gigabytes of right. information to, to, for them to be able to start to find patterns and do useful stuff within it. So um, that's, I guess, in a nutshell. And that, that leads to all kinds of questions of infrastructure, again, which is another obviously huge concern you know, in, in my work as well, is just learning how to see planetary scale infrastructures and learning how to see the politics that are embedded within them. And right? let me tease that out yeah. a little further. So I had the um, funny situation of being the, uh, uh, the lead staffer for a subcommittee focused on privacy in the Senate the day Edward Snowden went public. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing you kept on hearing from the NSA was, we got to collect the whole haystack to find yeah. the needle. And that never made sense to me yeah. until I understood this idea that you just said. Mm -hmm. and, and where we said, what, what are you talking about? You know, if you collect this size haystack and the needle, needle's in there, isn't that better than this kind of haystack? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the answers were always like, well, no, you need the whole haystack. But they never said, what we need is a vast scale of information that will allow us to run software on it that will see certain patterns that we simply cannot see mm -hmm. when you have this size haystack. Yeah. Similarly, when people actually talk about big data as big data, not big data as like this is fancy technology, which is very common. Um, this is also what they're talking about, this idea that, that you cannot glean the, th this kind of intelligence unless you have a planetary level network, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of, of scope and size of data. And so as a result of that technological fact, policy decisions are made about surveillance. You know, we have to watch everyone. We exactly, have yeah. to track everything in order to glean this right. information from it. And, you know, what are, like, the due process implications of something exactly. like that in a right. kind of classical legal paradigm? When that's that, the opposite yeah. of what the Fourth Amendment is about. The exactly. whole point of the Fourth Amendment is do not search everyone and everything unless you have, uh, uh, you know, particularized suspicion. And that does not drive with this idea of, yeah, but I can't know, I can't track this thing unless I do search everyone and track everything. Um, so it's, it's a real problem. But what's I mean, interesting here, to go back to a point that you made earlier, is that the lack of human becomes an alibi, right? Mm -hmm. Becomes an alibi. Explain In that. the sense that they say, you know, the, we're looking at metadata. We're not listening to your phone calls. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I don't want to go down this digression also, mm -hmm. but I mean, the other thing that comes out in your exhibit is this whole other language of surveillance, all the code names. Uh, um, and so part, what, what you're pointing out is this idea that for the NSA, and these are good people. They're not, they're not sitting there being like, oh, how are we gonna be evil? They, but they develop their own culture and their own vocabulary. And in the NSA vocabulary, you do not collect something until you actually pick it out of that haystack and look at it, right? There's another term for gathering the haystack and tracking everyone's phone calls, I forget what it is. Um, but collection only occurs when you read the thing, which is not what most humans call collection. Um, th what I love though was the language around the division patches, because I actually found those weirdly comforting, uh, um, <laughs> because it, it does suggest that humans are in charge. Unfortunately, it suggests that it's like teenage boys, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, but they're at least human, yeah. you know? Uh, um, teenage boys who love D&D &D a lot. Right, right, right. A lot of D&D. &D. Yeah, I, 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 I digress, but I think there's a little bit of this where in the old like sigils that like Venice would use. If you look at Venice, it's like a lion with the wings. Mm -hmm. And that clearly is a bunch of boys that are like, oh, we're gonna have a lion with wings. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kate, you did a great talk recently at the Royal Society when you, where you talked about the, the culture around engineering, mm, right? Yeah. And the notion of just an engineer. And it's really important, the work you do, in terms of pointing out the, the effects that these cultures have in terms of interpretation, in terms of you know, how we even consider reading. Well, I mean, uh, this is one of the things that we can forget, that, that all of these systems are being created in workplaces, in offices, where people sit around the water cooler and have conversations about what's the next challenge that we should address. And every one of those conversations materially affects 
what sorts of things are being built, what sorts of solutions are determined to be needed, you know, and, and how they'll work, and, and what the, the model of the human and of society is. And, and this is why I think Silicon Valley is, is at once so fascinating but so terrifying because it's such a narrow slice of society. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been there. It's a very particular vision of the world, and everyone there is extremely wealthy, and it's predominantly very white. Everyone had very similar education backgrounds. And they're like, well, this will work for me. Then it's going to be great. Right. I was like, well, actually, the rest of the world doesn't look like you. And that sort of presumption um, and to see how that gets baked in. And then at the same time, you see this really common refrain that, that I've gone back through the archives and it really starts to emerge in, in sort of the early 1960s where people who build these systems say, well, I'm just an engineer. It's not, you know, I'm not responsible. I mean, it's, it can, it, we'll see what happens when we let it loose on a live population, but I'm just an engineer. And I don't think we have the luxury of that anymore. I think these systems, if they're going to be fed into our most sensitive and important social institutions, are going to come with this real weight of responsibility. And that's what we have to articulate, I think, both through legal systems, but all through, th through norms, through how industry begins to understand itself. And, and I think there's all so much work to be done there. It's, it's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear from everyone else. I'm sure like, there's some questions in the audience that people would, would have on these questions as well. Do we get to open to Q&A? We will open to Q and awesome. A. Are, are you are you ready? I'm I'm definitely ready. How are you? Are you ready, Trevor? Sure. I'm ready. ready. All right, let's bring you guys in. <coughs> you probably heard enough from us. Unlikely. While they're, while they're assembling, I'm going to ask a question, which is which is one that we've already talked about a little bit, which is, can it be fixed? And um, when we when we when we had when we spoke about this a little while ago, essentially um, Wendy is is giving us sort of models of potential fixes. Um, Trevor is saying it can't be fixed. It's a, you can't get out of the box. And I th and I think uh, I think Katie's ambivalent, and I'm not sure where Alvaro stands. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about this as the line is forming. <laughs> For and against, go. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm such a jerk. Like sometimes I have questions that I ask people that if they do the right answer, then I'll keep talking to them. If they get it wrong, I'm like, oh. But one of my questions for a long time was like, do you think like AI systems are, is racism a feature or a bug of these systems? And if someone's like, it's a bug, I'm like, no, it's a feature. <laughs> you know? And like it, that was sort of one of my little like tests in terms of like calibrating where people were or something like that. You know? um, but because like we, to what extent, like, if you're building systems that are designed to discriminate, like, to like, it's called discriminate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so in that sense, that I mean, that is a legitimate kind of philosophical question, and there is a lot of subtlety to it. But I actually, to me, that represents a kind of a hard limit, right? You know, in other words, if you are going to say that you can build a technical system that's not racist, then you have to define what that not racism would be. And like any definition of that is probably going to be pretty difficult to articulate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, the way th I translate this in the face recognition land, and I see both sides of it is, some people who are, you know, uh, who identifies women, who are, have lighter complexions, who are young, say, I have no problem with these systems having a hard time finding me. Yeah. Um, but, then, and, 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 but then I'll say, yeah, the problem is if they don't find the person they're looking for, they might end up saying it's you. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because a lot of these systems aren't designed to give you no for an answer. They're not designed to say, yeah. oh, we're looking for this woman, yeah. uh, didn't find her, sorry. You know, they're instead designed to say, these are the most you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. likely people who you're looking for. Yeah. And for those categories of folks, it's more likely to be wrong. And so, um, so I think in DC, we're focused on making it less terrible, <laughs> uh, uh, which is, is, is a modest goal, but I think a <laughs> worthwhile goal nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Uh, thanks. The, your last comment about DC being about making it less terrible is in a way appropriate and links to the comment about early engineers of these systems saying, hey, I'm just an engineer. One of my favorite quotes that guides a lot of my life and work is attributed to Churchill saying about democracy, it's the worst form of political system except the, all, the, all the others that we've tried. And in a way, you could say about AI, it's the worst form of 
applying computational power to deep social challenges, except the, all the others we've, been try, we've tried, and that a lot of our work is figuring out how to make what we've already done less bad as a species. And in my own work, that's certainly what it's about, about figuring out how to make less bad and how to design better. So I'm curious for the panelists who work so deeply in this space of AI, which is a space with which I'm not familiar, where are the moments that you see hope in, in, in the sense of both instances of recognizing the feedback that we're getting about the mistakes that we've made and being able to apply that recognition constructively, either at an in individual or larger systemic level, to be able to adjust, because w these systems are already in play. We're needing to adjust. So where are the moments of hope in terms of instances, but also techniques, like interdisciplinary centers within academic institutions, or the methods that will help us? Thanks. Great question. Everyone's looking at me. I was like the font of hope today. Well, I think though that I see a lot of hope in the work that you're yes. doing. For example, I see a lot of hope in the work that you're, that all of you guys are doing in the sense of trying to reframe the questions, yeah. like trying to approach them from disciplines that are not rooted in computer science, you know, um, and they're bringing different tools to task. You know, and I think a lot about, you know, especially within the legal context, and like thinking about the the moment in which we move from indeterminate to determinate sentencing as being a really pivotal moment as well. You know, in the sense of, you know, looking in the 60s, you know, at least in a state like California, if you got busted for drugs or something like that, you'd get, you know, one to 20 years or something like that, right? right? And you'd go to prison, and then depending on how you, if you were rehabilitated or something like that, you'd get out when, you know, judges or whoever said that you could get out. And what ended up happening, of course, like white people got out early and black people like stayed in for the majority of the uh, term. And so we said like, this is a racist system because the judges are racist and are you know, keeping the you know, black people locked up and then the white people out. So there was a move to move to like truth in sentencing, right? Everybody was gonna get the same sentence for the same crime. And that kind of had the, that didn't make the racism go away, and in fact kind of strongly created a situation in which you were just locking more and more people up for longer and longer amounts of time, because of course then if you wanted to you know, be tough on crime, you would ratchet up the, what those determinate sentences would be. And I guess for me that paradigm of the indeterminate sentence is maybe something to kind of revisit you know, as, a, as a kind of alternative way of thinking about um, how systems can work. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I love this question um, because I think it, it, it highlights one of the, the big decision trees we're gonna have to follow in the next few years. One is, uh, and you, you'll see it in sort of a lot of the sort of discourse around these tools, is that oh, if only we turn them against the powerful, then mm -hmm. we can hold powerful people to account using the tools of artificial intelligence. I'm like, okay, yes, but then you have a master's house, master's tools problem, um, which is that in many cases, these systems are actually not designed to be turned on the powerful. Again, the data is not being collected, say, about white collar crime in the same way that we have about crime in what are seen as sort of low income, marginalized neighborhoods. Um, so it's a lot harder than it sounds, which doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it means that it, it worries me when I see people investing all of their political hope in just using these tools, but for good. So you have things like AI for good. I'm like, do you know that that's kind of saying that the rest of AI is for bad? You might not want to be using that. So I, I, I'm really concerned that we, we don't put all of our political hopes in, in these tools as being the only way to get answers and to get change. Now, does that mean that there are uh, ways we can do this better? I think absolutely there are, but I think we have to be prepared to ask some really hard questions. I, I, would, I would also say that some of the, the, the ways that, again, if we're talking about criminal justice, one of the problems that, say, risk assessment scoring has been designed to try and address is whether or not someone will turn up to their, to their bail hearing and they'll get a score, and if they don't turn up and that score is bad, then they can actually you know, be denied bail. But we've got research of like 30 years standing that shows that the reason people don't turn up to these hearings is because they can't get childcare or they can't get transport, and that one of the best things you could do is have rideshare available or have childcare available. These, these old school approaches to how you build sort of thick social connection and sort of welfare safety nets are actually much more effective than just putting in Technical systems that claim to tell you who the good people are and the bad people are. 
So I, I really want to say that I, I haven't given up on these um, older forms of knowledge, but the real question is how do we incorporate those with these newer systems? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fair. And it gets to something that we were discussing earlier, which is if part of the problem is these risk assessment systems don't work and they're really expensive. So you can think about all the money that's being spelt, spent right now with healthcare, right? Targeting, you know, what you're doing, which is making you more at risk than someone else. So you should pay X more than Y and Z and all the billing and everything else that's involved with that. Treat everyone as levelly human, single payer healthcare. That would take out, you know, a lot and save us a lot of money. That's, that's one thing we can say, okay, this isn't working, let's come up with another solution. The other thing is, and this is part of the old engineer in me, is like, I'm also thinking, we can actually build systems that are fundamentally different, right? So, so a lot of this pattern recognition relies on segregation, right? Key nearest neighbor, the notion that you're similar to the person next to you, right? This just didn't come about on its own. Um, segregation has a long history, and there's a way in which homophily and clustering based on sameness has become embedded within these networks. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't have to be the way things are, right? You could have heterophily, the fact that opposites attract, right? This is how electricity works. Um, how many of you know people who are heterosexual? <laughs> okay, so apparently opposites do attract sometimes, right? I mean, we don't have to accept these terms under which this clustering is happening. We can think up different algorithms. We can, we can work together precisely across disciplines um, in really productive ways. Thank you very much to the panel. Um, I feel a bit gross bringing this topic up, but this week saw the sale of the quote, first AI painting, unquote, for a fairly obscene <laughs> amount of money at $435,000. And it's yes. easy to dismiss that painting as a banal marketing grab. Um, but I wonder if the panel has thoughts on that sale being perhaps a more revealing point for the intersection of what we're here in an art museum between visual culture, art, AI, and the naked capital that was at its disposal. Thank you. I had a bet running, by the way, to see who was going to bring that up first, and so you won. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm curious what Trevor thinks, because obviously, if, if you haven't seen the story about this 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 work, it just sold for I think $435,000. It was expected to go for like 10k. I think part of the reason it went for such an inflated price was because there was this huge news cycle around first AI work, even though it's secretly not, and these works have been around since the 60s. No, they were they, they were very careful. This is the first AI work at auction. At auction. Yeah. Oh, but Which yeah. Is like like a weird, weird, like, what criteria yeah. is that? Like, usually if something goes up at auction, that's like a bad thing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But, but, the, but the reason it's so fascinating, and this is why I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Trevor on the spot here, is because of course, I mean, you can just grab this code off GitHub and you can run an image and then put it up and say, hey, Christy, sell this work. Um, so there's a real sort of line that's emerging around what is authorial intent, like who has created the work, you know, what, what role does yeah. the algorithm play here? I'm yeah, curious. I mean, I mean, that, I mean that's, that, that it, I, I didn't really read the, the stuff. I mean, I saw that that, that, it, that image was happening. I was like, this is like this crap that the auction houses do to you know, try to drum up people to go to their things. Um, but, but I saw that there was all this, this controversy about authorship and yeah. did the, who made the algorithm? Or are they the author? And, and I'm just like, whoa, I thought this conversation ended like in 1972, you know? <laughs> it's like I didn't really be worried about that kind of thing anymore. Um, but I, of course we do in, in the art world. Um, I guess my take on it is there's like a fundamental other problem with this metaphor of like artificial intelligence, right? I mean, the, the fact that the, the word like intelligence is in the word AI is such a problem and is so misleading you know, and is so mystifying and just come and makes us have so many bad ideas that, um, that it's, it, 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 it's, it's stunning. Um, so when we're talking about artificial, and you talk about this a lot, and you, when people in the 50s are talking about artificial intelligence, they're talking about something completely different than what, than what we're talking about by artificial intelligence now. So now we're typically talking about machine learning, having huge data sets and using neural networks to find patterns across them. What artificial, this is a, a leaf quote, a leaf zinger at the studio is uh, artificial intelligence otherwise known as algebra. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it, 
Um, and, and that's really, that's what it is. It's incredibly simplistic in a way in terms of what it is doing. But you have a phenomena where you can build a neural network, for example, that in the course of several weeks can play more games of Go than the entire history of humans that have been able to play games of Go and look for winning patterns across those enormous, that huge number of games. And of course it's gonna find moves that you can make within Go games that humans were never able to make because maybe the humans have played one billion Go games. If you can play 100 billion Go games, you're gonna find a lot of stuff that humans haven't found yet, right? So when the Go AI beats Go grandmasters, we, it has the effect of appearing superhuman, right? It does something that a human has never seen before because it can find patterns that we can't find. And that creates a kind of, and we imagine that that is magic or super intelligent or something like that, but um, it feels like something superhuman is going on. And what does this have to do with that painting? Well, I think like that brings up these questions of authorship again, right? There, that idea of intelligence implies some kind of agency, something kind of human and analogous to a way that an artist might make a piece of work or a writer might work or something like that. But I, but I think the whole conversation is based on a flawed assumption. I think what it's much more akin to is, you know, Saul LeWitt writing a rule book and say, okay, these are the rules of my piece and then you follow the rules and like it's gonna generate this kind of image or John Cage sitting there flipping coins yeah. and then composing a piece of music that way. I, for me, that's my experience of working with AI. And so what's authorship? I don't know, I mean, and someone's an author of an AI painting in the way that Saul LeWitt is an author of a Saul LeWitt drawing even though it's sort of algorithmically generated as well. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's more to, we could go further into that, but I think I sort of put enough <laughs> crap out there. To <laughs> um, thank you, panel. This has really been uh, invigorating and interesting, and, and just thanks so much. Um, my question is about counterfactuals. So if one of the problems in our validation is that basically our society is using algorithms that validate our societal biases, where are those places we can start digging for counterfactuals to our society? And I, I work for the World Wildlife Fund, so I, I and I work at the intersection of forest and climate. So I do. Um, I'm one of the modelers that gets to engage also with indigenous knowledge, and mm -hmm. I love being proven wrong or being shown how wrong I am in something. I really enjoy that experience um, through you know observation of phenology and timing and what what they're seeing. So I just didn't know to what degree is this precious resource of indigenous knowledge being used as a potential counterfactual in some of these conversations? Is that being explored at all, or are there other counterfactuals that would be really wonderful to hear about? And then just lastly, a comment, Trevor, the, the moment in image operations when the, when the filters all go away, I haven't felt so thankful to be a human in a long time, so, <laughs> so thank you so much for that experience, so thank you. This is technical enough that I probably shouldn't answer it. I don't think I'm in a position to answer it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say absolutely, just quickly, yes, and then, then pass to Wendy, that there are some extraordinary people working on precisely this question around uh, models of indigenous knowledge and models of learning and this idea of how that's being ingested by large-scale ML systems and, and who gets a say in how that knowledge is used, I think is really is really important and interesting. And Jane Anderson is one scholar doing this work at NYU. Um, uh, one of the sort of best paper awards uh, that was given just recently, um, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, was looking precisely at how we start to understand and encode indigenous knowledge and, and who has the right to sort of say when that's, when that's okay and when that's not. I, I would say counterfactuals are fascinating and I'm gonna throw that one to Wendy because I know that's something that you've thought a bit about. Mm -hmm. First of all, in, in terms of um, uh, the field of indigenous new media, th there's a lot of work being done around it, especially um, not just as counterfactuals, but the ways in which they call into question certain notions of both property and openness. Um, so all around, you know, how knowledge has been exploited, for whom. Um, there's a great collective in New Zealand, I've just forgotten their name, that, that have been doing some fantastic work around this. Haystack, which is the humanities, arts, sciences, technology, give me the other A, um, uh, collaboratory, 
um, is having a conference in 2019 dedicated to indigenous um, new media, where they're taking up um, these issues. Um, so I would definitely point you there. And I think that the, the question of, um, oh, and then in terms of uh, sovereign media, and, and um, if you know the word, work of Jody Bird, um, she's fantastic. She's been doing some really fantastic work around video games and issues of um, sovereignty and indigenous media. But I think that maybe um, we need to think broadly about counterfactuals. Um, because what's interesting to me is, speaking as, as someone who also you know, went from engineering to literature, is that the literary and the fictional for a long time have actually been considered to be true yet not correct. Mm -hmm. Like people read something and somehow it registers as true, but it's not verifiable. Um, and so I think that looking at a larger notion of authenticity is really important. So I'm starting a new project on um, fake news called Beyond Verification um, that looks at how things become authenticated or, or, or how we can understand larger notions of authenticity. Cool. Hi, Trevor. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm seeing a bit of a tension between the Was sort that of- Was Josh? Yeah. What's up, dude? Hey, what's going on? <laughs> uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a tension, and I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, the implications um, of the potential tension between the responses that we're talking about here tonight, whether from policy or from ethical or from artistic perspectives, and the sort of general cultural acceptance of uh, surveillance as a service, for lack of a better word, for 123andMe and mm -hmm. Fitbit and Alexa and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. being things that we're voluntarily not only opting into, but buying. Uh, I'll take my question off the air. Um, uh, I, I don't have an answer to it per se, but I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. And I do think, and we were talking about this earlier, we need to differentiate between the use case uh, because I think, um, I think that people tend to speak about this technology and surveillance as a monolith when there's actually quite a lot of different, different things going on. Um, so, um, so let's take favorite subject, face recognition. Uh, um, and, um, and I think there's a really strong argument. So actually, um, two weeks ago, Congress passed what I'm pretty sure is the first instance of a, a, a sort of an anti-bias restriction in a piece of federal legislation with respect to biometric technology. Um, it said that the TSA and CBP have to measure, try to measure the bias in its biometric screening of, airport pass uh, of airline passengers and report back on whether it exists and how to fix it. Uh, um, laws and sausages, it's not everything you'd want. Um, it, uh, it doesn't have an auditability provision. Uh, um, it doesn't require um, measuring bias intersectionally. Uh, uh, so they can just be like, oh, white folks compared to black folks, you know, it's this much of a difference. Men, women, this much of a difference. And when you add up all those things, it actually ends up being this much of a difference. But it's there. And, and frankly, I think we're better for it being there. Um, on the other hand, you have commercial face recognition technology being used to secretly track you on the street uh, um, to try figure out who's a shoplifter, who isn't, who's a VIP, who isn't. Um, and I think the rules around this, uh, um, and, I, and I haven't sort of stacked this dichotomy up, I'm kind of thinking on the fly here, um, but you need to have different rules for different systems. Um, and um, I think that Another thing I see from my vantage point is there's a lot of scientific thinking that is kind of just imported out to the rest of our lives as a universal good. So, uh, um, you know, we think, oh, in science, it is better to know all things. And suddenly, you know, for us, oh, it's better that we know, you know, our heart rate at all times and our calories at all times just for our personal consumption. When that's totally crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> I, and I think that, uh, um, I think you see that a lot. Uh, um, and, um, and so I think, yeah. I'll leave it there. I love this question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I think this is this is one of the big issues of our time because I think what isn't what people don't necessarily think about is what this tiny moment of convenience mm -hmm. is costing. Mm 
And not just in terms of you, not just in terms of the fact that for you to go, Alexa, turn on the lights, so you've just basically saved yourself this one gesture. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but in doing that, you have summoned into being this extraordinarily vast extractive network that begins with mining and smelting and logistics and container shipping to get all of the pieces and parts to make one little you know, Amazon Echo. And then this huge training system, which is using your voice and using your voice as a data point to train better responses across millions of people. And then these huge AI ingestion engines, which keep using that data, in addition to the fact that you know, as you are being recorded in, in your interactions with, say, an in-home listening device, that can be subpoenaed. I mean, mm -hmm. we're seeing that used in, in murder cases and beyond. You've, you've basically brought in this impartial witness to sit inside your bedroom or living room every day. But in addition to sort of summoning this network, which is profoundly extractive and profoundly scary, really, when you think about the environmental implications of these tiny conveniences that we've created that are going to have lasting long-term issues for the planet. We just um, published a, a large-scale study called The Anatomy of AI that just yes. traced one, uh, one echo to see what it really costs in the kind of planetary sense to make one of these for that moment of convenience. And I think we're just not trained into thinking about how the real, the true cost of these, of these conveniences. And I, I'm really hoping that one of the things that I, I'm invested in doing is to try and change the conversation so we can just at least start to see what is the real cost when we, when we buy one of these things. And I would say this is a brilliant piece. Everyone should yes, read yes. it. It is the absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I would add to that in terms of what we should rethink is I think we should rethink insurance. Yes. I mean, if we think <laughs> about it, let's say, OK, you're going to save a dollar or how much <laughs> by having something track you all the time, right? Um, and like, so the first human beings who were insured were African American slaves, OK? Um, life insurance as well has this whole history around questions of risks and inequality. You can make the argument that insurance has been all about um, putting in place inequality. Um, and not only is it um, unjust, it costs a lot of money, it's inefficient, um, it means that we have this bloated bureaucratic structure and technical structure. We're destroying the planet, why? Um, so I think as well we need to have to, to put these two conversations together. I, I love that you just raised insurance because I mean, if you think about the model of how insurance works, it's the idea of pooling risk. Mm -hmm. That we don't know exactly you know, what you're gonna get or what I'm gonna get, or if I'm gonna get sick or you'll get sick, but we're all gonna take a shared risk together right. in the hope that we all get looked after. What happens when you have these systems that are designed to get to such levels of specificity and precision that I know exactly the likelihood that you're going to get Alzheimer's and the likelihood that I might get diabetes and we are going to be differentially insured, that's not pooled risk. Yeah. That's actually a very stark form of valuing human life that's really going to cost us in ways that we are yet to see. Exactly. Yeah. Any more questions? So let me preface this by saying that I am an engineer. I write code <laughs> for a living, and I think about a lot of the questions that the panel has been discussing on a day-to-day -day basis. And given that our reality is the only reality that we know and understand, to what extent do the panelists, and especially Trevor, entertain the possibility that we're living in a computer simulation? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are definitely living in a computer simulation. It's called capitalism. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, that's not an original thought. There's a fr my friend Hita Styrel said, uh, you know, that we were talking, she said, you know, the singularity had already happened. It's called neoliberalism. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks so much to the panel. It's really been quite fascinating. I was uh, really happily surprised by the fact that the panel brought in eugenics and made it so central uh, as a historical development of thought to thinking about AI. And one of the things that struck me about uh, Trevor's exhibition is when you walk into it, you know, he says, this isn't about the complexity of the content of the collection, it's about trying to look at the door, you mm -hmm. know, just where it's coming into. Um, and that, that's such a whole new way of thinking about things, you know, and if I had taken a picture of a 
satellite of a satellite station 37 miles away would have thrown it out and decided no one would want to look at it. Um, but it trains you to think about what it means that we have to look at this thing from 37 miles out. Um, and the discussion of eugenics, you know, made me think Goddard's system, which was to bring in all of this complex information, IQ tests, mm -hmm. family hereditary trees, physiognomic markers uh, that Lombroso had developed in Italy. That's an enormous amount of information generated. And then Goddard, I think the power of the system was to produce something that said we were all N or F, normal or feeble-minded. You know, and I was thinking about how central disability is uh, to what's been being, dis uh, being discussed here as well as race uh, totally. and, and sex um, as well. And then I, th I thought of also about the fact that in Nazi Germany, the people who were first killed in gas chambers were patients in psychiatric institutions. Mm -hmm. And what the Nazis did is the people who ran those killings, they took the youngest, least experienced, almost not even out of graduate school medical people in order to do it. In other words, it was about this kind of filtration of massive complexity into the real power of the system, which was generated into this incredibly simplistic binary code that almost anybody could apply. Mm. You know, so for instance, uh, physicians were only supposed to turn the gas nozzles in gas chambers, but they started having the people who were throwing bodies into crematory ovens and stuff like that do it, because it didn't matter. It, was, it wasn't an expertise that was in fact the mm -hmm. kind of primary pilot or control. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about um, Wendy, I, I think your name is, I'm just thieving. Yeah, so I'm Wendy. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, your argument about the fact that we didn't have to think this way, you mm -hmm. know, that we could throw those models out. But mm -hmm. the thing that I'm, I keep on getting brought back to is the mm -hmm. fact that it really is the power of that binary code that somehow is at the basis of this. And I was just wondering what if the panel could kind of talk a little bit about whether or not they think that's still the basis of the power ultimately of something like AI, is that it can be, all of this data can be transported into these incredibly simplistic systems that are massively discriminatory as, tra as Trevor was pointing out. But in fact, that's their draw. How do, how do we avoid the lure mm -hmm. of the seduction of the fact that, that it, it's, it's, the, it's the power of the simplicity of the discriminatory system mm -hmm. that in fact is, is the thing that dr seems to draw human beings to it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so thank you, that's an excellent point. Um, and one way I've been thinking through that question is, there's been a lot of work done in the history of science that argues that the fundamental logic of eugenics is segregation. Um, so you don't have to go to what's been called negative segregation. You can, all, so neg sorry, negative um, eugenics, even the notion of the positive eugenics, right? Had within it at a fundamental core, the idea that one must segregate, right? And that was a fundamental decision that was made. Um, again, if you look at linear discriminators, which are um, now SVM support vector um, uh, machines, which are embedded within pattern recognition, those came from linear discriminators, which came from Sir Ronnie Fisher's work, um, who, as the term implied, wanted to linearly discriminate between races. Um, and he had um, measurements of people's um, skulls. Right? And, and it was a continuous line. And so what that linear discriminator does is create that boundary within continuous systems in order so you can have the emergence of, of races. And this I know is something that both Trevor and Kate have been doing a lot of work on. Um, so. I, I just wanna say thank you for that comment and, and particularly thinking about sort of the history of disability here is incredibly important and, and again is sort of being um, being reinvoked by these systems that only see sort of one vision of like the normal human, um, and I think it's it's increasingly concerning. Um, I, I would think I, I want to sort of I try to approach this question of you know is it because these systems are so simplistic? And I think even if you have an incredibly complex system, there is a tendency to do exactly what you said, which is to simplify it and make it not about expertise. And I'll give you just one example um, and then throw it back to the panel. You might have read recently that, um, that ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement in the US, designed, uh, had a very, very basic algorithmic system that would decide whether an, an immigrant in, in custody would be um, able to be held or released. 
and this was, you know, a, a pretty, you know, straightforward system. Um, they manually tampered with it themselves so that it would produce only one answer, 100% detained. So that's not, that is not a complex system. That is, a, that is actually not even a system. That is a single answer that has been and is currently right now being applied across the board in the US. So I mean, no matter how complex you make these systems, we're always going to be subject to human decisions, and in many cases, human decisions under particular forms of political pressure. And we are, we are living the results of that right now. <laughs> Another highly flawed human layer here is, um, is that, you know, we've been talking, it's been a theme on the panel, the disparate impact of these systems, right? But when you look at how our elected officials discuss surveillance, the only thing they talk about is how everyone is watched, right? This, this persistent, disparate impact that is blatantly obvious at every corner of our history is simply never mentioned. So if you look at the history of the African American community in our country, Look at the 20th century, if you are a prominent African American 20th century, you were surveilled either by the FBI or by something called the Military Intelligence Division's Negro Subversion Division, um, or by the NSA. Uh, and in fact, the NSA disclosed that it had also surveilled Martin Luther King like two months into the Snowden scandal, but no one talked about it on, in the floor of the Senate, ever. In a committee hearing in the floor of the Senate, it came up a tiny little bit in the House, but you know, on the ground, the impact is categorically biased. In Congress, it's as if you know this disparate impact were totally invisible. Mm -hmm. So you have to add that layer on to everything we're talking about here. I would just throw out the name Simone Brown. Yes. Um, she's written this amazing book uh, called Dark Matters, which goes to the centrality of race um, to the emergence of surveillance. Yeah. Hi. That's this good. is also a question about humans. So. Um, no small irony. Oh, one sec. We've got one more. One more answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I think no, no. Oh, I thought oh. you were saying you no, wanted no, no, to talk. No, no, no. Okay, go oh, ahead. Sure. Sorry. So we've got two more questions. Okay. So no small irony that, and I think it's been mentioned that where we are in D.C., which is you know largely a company town, and there's there's a lot of you know government contractors, military, civilians, who are coming through here and looking at your work. Um, so my question is to all of the panel, um, what would you hope that they took away from it with regards to how they see the world? Cool. Um, thank you. I mean, so I guess what I think about what art can do is that I think it can help you learn how to see. And when I say that, I don't even mean that metaphorically. I mean that literally. I mean, like, I think that <clears throat> things are happening in front of our eyes every day that we do not know how to recognize. And I think that, for me anyway, art is a way, like why I enjoy being an artist is that it's a, every day a project of trying to learn how to see what the hell is going on around you, like just very simply. And so, and because that's always changing, you know, like that, that practice is always changing, the kinds of images that you're making is always changing. And so for me, art is like, and the other part of that, I guess, is that, that the, the, what art I hope can do is give you a tiny glimpse into how things could be different or a tiny glimpse into what, how these logics, how, how a, a logic of an infrastructure or of a set of cultural conventions or what have you could be different, right? Our art can help you, you know, question your own assumptions, you know, that are built into the way that you're seeing. And so in terms of what's been, I have done a lot of work over the years looking at, you know, military secrecy and and what, whether that, you know, on the intelligence side or the military side, on the corporate side, um, what have you. And I, it's been interesting to have like just a huge range of different kinds of responses to that. You know, um, I, I wrote a book about those uniform badges of like uh, secret military projects and it was, 
really a weird audience that developed around that in the sense it was like a bestseller in the military and on like democracy now. <laughs> you know? And for me, like the point of me making work is like I don't actually care about being ecumenical. You know, I mean, I do have particular things that I'm looking at and there's reasons why I'm looking at them because I think they're important to look at. But at the same time, I do think that images are very squishy things and that you cannot tie specific kinds of meanings to them. They're not arguments in the way that an essay can make an argument or a way that a journal argument can make an, a journal can make an argument. And it is precisely in that squishiness or even arbitrariness that we can find a kind of freedom. And that actually brings us back to this whole question of machine learning and AI, which is all about the attribution of meanings to images, whether that's facial recognition or whether that's de defining who somebody's gender. And when you look at the history of art, for me, like so much of it is about people experimenting and trying to define the world in different ways, trying to define themselves in different ways. Um, when I think about the civil rights movement, I literally picture that in my head in part through the artwork of somebody like Emery Douglas. When I think about feminism, I literally see that in my head in part through artists like Martha Rossler and Jenny Holzer. When I see you know, queer activism, I see that literally through the eyes of you know, like a grand fury or artists who have made images that tell you that the world does not mean what you thought it mean, meant before that. And, and for me, I guess that is the higher, highest thing that one can actually aspire to as an artist. Shall we move to the last question? Thank you all so much. Um, that kind of ties in with my question, which is about this topic that you brought up about art's power to bring these topics into the vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the role of aesthetic beauty in the work mm -hmm. and the ethics of that. Yeah. Um, so in objects like the Trinity Cube, beauty is used to speak about really horrifically violent um, technologies mm -hmm. and historical events. And I would almost contrast that with the sort of nonsensical images produced by the monster AI yeah. dreams. And I was wondering if you could speak about your use of beauty. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, and I'm, I'm glad that you think the Trinity is beautiful. I do, I do too. <laughs> um, so, you know, I would love to live in a world in which beautiful things were good and bad things were ugly. That would make everything so much simpler. <laughs> you know? um, but you know, whether or not we think reconnaissance satellites are a good thing or not, if I take you out and we look at the night sky together and we find one moving through the sky, there are, there's few things on Earth that you will find that are more beautiful than that. You know? And that, to me, isn't a contradiction. For me, there's something about curiosity within that. There's something about the ways in which the meaning of a landscape, like the stars, you know, the, the stars can mean something different now than, than they did in the past. Um, but I think that also, I, I do wanna, we use different aesthetic tropes as ways of communicating with people. So, you know, if you're a writer, you know, someone like Cormac McCarthy can be a, a beautiful writer in a way that's very different than like a Rec Rebecca Solnit might be a beautiful writer, but it's part of the craft. And you're using the, the way that something looks as a way to try to create a vocabulary or I wouldn't say exactly tell a story, but something like tell a story. You know? And you, you, you can use those aesthetic strategies to emphasize one thing or another. You know, so for me, the, the, the photographs of the reconnaissance, reconnaissance satellites are photographs about the sky and about what does it mean to look at the sky in 2018 or what is that landscape? You know, and the same thing with the oceans and um, <coughs> et cetera. So for me, ha having that, that aesthetic language is part of the, it's like, it's like picking adjectives almost if you are <laughs> writing a story. You know? All right. Thank you all for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking this wonderful group. <laughs>